The title of today's message is Fit for Duty. The text is Luke chapter 9, 57 through 62. Luke chapter 9, 57 through 62. Now I have a cousin, and he served in the Marines, and uh, he told several stories about his time while he was in the Marines. And one of those that I always remembered was him telling about the portion of his service where he served as a military policeman, or an MP, if you will. And part of his duties would be was they would check the roster at whatever time the soldiers were supposed to be back on the base, and whoever was missing, they'd have to go get them. And uh, he'd go and search for these men, and many times he would find them in bars, drunk and usually belligerent when he told them it was time to come home. To return to base. Now, not only was that foolish in light of the fact that my cousin was, after all, a law enforcement officer, but also because he had a reputation for being both a tough and dirty fighter who refused to argue with inebriated men. In fact, several times my cousin was reprimanded because he would find a soldier in such a state that clearly indicated that soldier was not fit for duty. And rather than ask the person kindly to get in the Jeep and come back to base, my cousin would just walk up and knock him out, throw him over his shoulder, go out and lay him in the Jeep and drive on to the next bar to get the next one. And uh, he was reprimanded quite a few times for doing that. And uh, I asked him about it. I said, well, why did you do that? And he said, well, it saved time and it was the easiest thing to do when a soldier was no longer fit for duty. Now, while I don't necessarily agree with the reasoning behind his actions, I do, however, understand his viewpoint on being fit for duty. His viewpoint was that if the soldier wasn't fit for duty, he wasn't worth spending a great deal of time on. Now, before you criticize my cousin's viewpoint, I would like you to consider Jesus' viewpoint on being fit for duty. And the purpose of today's message is to ask yourself if you are fit for duty as a soldier of the King of Kings. Now to answer that question of your fitness for duty, we will consider three qualifications Jesus set for his soldiers. They are one, to have a commitment to follow Christ regardless of the cost. Two, Christ must be their first priority. And three, Christ must be the ultimate authority who has our unswerving loyalty. You see, my fellow soldiers, the Bible declares that those who choose to follow Jesus are to do so without hesitation or reservation. Absolute loyalty is to be the norm, not the exception. Folks, to be a Christian is to commit without wavering to the work of the kingdom of God. Kingdom priorities become our priorities. Jesus' priorities become our priorities. Jeffrey B. Kelly, the author of Liberating Faith, Bonhoeffer's message for today, says it this way. Discipleship means nothing less than living in conformity with Christ as He is revealed within the community and being ready to obey Christ as unconditionally as the disciples. Turn with me to our text for today, Luke chapter 9, 57 through 62. In these six verses, Jesus spells out the depth of commitment He expects from His followers. He's looking for a different type of disciple. One who, after committing himself to the cause, will not harbor second thoughts about it. Read together with me. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, follow me. 
But the man said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those back at home. And Jesus said to him, No man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus is, is approached by these three potential disciples, these would-be disciples, if you will. And what's so remarkable about this passage we just read is the response Jesus gives to each of these candidates on his viewpoint of what it means to be fit for duty as a soldier in God's service. Now, as a a bystander or observer watching this going on, he might be scratching his head and uh, asking the question, just what does this guy, this, this Jesus, expect of those who seek to follow him? It seems like he's turning away more disciples than he takes on. Well, today we're going to determine what fitness for duty means to Jesus. Now, the first man had told Jesus what? I will follow you wherever you go. Now, listen to that. He walks up to him and says, Look, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replies, Well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, on the face of the would-be disciple's statement, I will follow you wherever you go, we would think that Jesus would be overjoyed, right? Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And the reason we would think that is because, unlike Jesus, we can't see into that man's heart. We can't understand the motivation behind his expression of loyalty. We can't understand whether he understood what he was even saying. But Jesus did. There was something about this would-be disciple's desire to follow the Lord that caused the Lord to challenge him, that caused Jesus to respond, you say you want to follow me, but do you know what that will cost you? Do you know what that will involve? Did Jesus see in this person someone who was quicker with his words than with his deeds? Someone who gave mouth service but not action? You see, to follow Jesus meant a life that would be no better off than that of beasts of the field, the foxes and the birds. Did this would-be disciple know and understand this? You see, folks, being a follower of Jesus entails a degree of separation and isolation from the world. Following Jesus means, as the Apostle Peter put it in 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, listen to his, to be strangers in this world. Why? Because Jesus calls us to new priorities, to new values, and to new ways of daily living which are in stark contrast to the ways of the world. They're different. They're not the things that we grew up that we're used to. They're not the things that the world advertises on TV. They're not the things that our friends invite us to do. They're new priorities, new values, and new ways of living. And you see, Jesus was ultimately on His way to His own execution in Jerusalem. The way of Christ was the way of the cross. The way of Christ entailed suffering and persecution... We as Americans today have a hard time comprehending that. And yet I can think of one American today who is suffering for the cause of Christ. Pastor Saeed, who is in prison in Iran. 
Pastor Saeed Abedini was sentenced to eight years in prison for evangelizing in the Islamic Republic. He was in Iran to build an orphanage in 2012 when he was arrested and tried and sentenced to eight years in prison. Now not only is Pastor Saeed in prison for his faith, but recent news has been that as they have had to arrest some ISIS folks, even in Iran, for things they've done wrong, they have tried to kill him in prison. And he continues to receive death threats daily from those in prison with him who hate him, not just because he's a Christian, not just because he's an American, but because he was converted from the Muslim faith. They want to him to die. You see, for Pastor Saeed, his commitment to follow Christ has meant that he has sacrificed comfort, security, health, his family, and it may even cost him his life. You see, there's a cost for following Jesus. Rejection is a part of it. Now, we in America have not truly experienced the hardship of being a disciple of Christ yet. I believe, however, that time is coming. So I ask you, what about us? Are we fit for duty? Will we follow Jesus unconditionally? Will we be willing to sacrifice our comfort, our security, our health, and even our life to be called a follower of Christ? Jesus expects nothing less. Now the second would-be disciple, after being invited by the Lord to follow Him, replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus replied to him, what? Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now Jesus is telling both that man and us today that following Jesus means he must be the first priority in our life. Even above family loyalties and expectations. Now, Jesus was not telling us to reject the needs of our loved ones or even to attend the funeral of one's parents. His counsel was simply, if you want to follow me, I have to be your first priority. People die every day. And we miss chances every day to be used by God to proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus does not accept second place. Jesus Christ does not accept second place. Proclaiming the kingdom of God, the good news of Jesus Christ for us today, demands our allegiance above every other commitment we have in this world. Now that sounds pretty radical, doesn't it? Well, folks, when you accepted Jesus, you accepted a life that would be radical. In fact, Jesus calls us to be radical. We're to be strangers in this world. People are to look at us and ask us what planet we're from like we've got three ears or something. We should stand out in that type of stark contrast to the world. We should be a community of people whose number one mission church is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Whether we do it with our words or our deeds. Jesus Himself said in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26 that if anyone came to Him and loved His father, His mother, His wife and children, His brothers and sisters, yes, even His own life more than Him, then He could not be His disciple. Jesus 
must have first priority. Now the third would-be disciple said, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me first go back and say goodbye to my family. You know, they're going to miss me. They're going to wonder where I am. And I'm just going to let them know and give them that last hug and kiss. And then I'll be right back. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This would-be disciple wanted to get his families okay before following the Lord. But Jesus accepts no higher authority. Loyalty to Jesus was far above and remains far above loyalty to one's father or any cultural family traditions. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, that's a, an analogy that some people don't understand today. There's not many farmers anymore. But to do a, a plow a furrow so you could plant seeds, you had to guide the furrow and get the animal to pull it along. And you couldn't make a straight furrow if you were looking back. You'd be all over the field. And Jesus was saying, if you want to walk on that straight and narrow path, keep your eyes focused on me. We cannot wholeheartedly live for Jesus with constant second thoughts and reservations. We cannot wholeheartedly live for Jesus with constant second thoughts and reservations. Why should Christ be our first and our utmost priority? There's an old saying goes that there's no satisfaction like soul satisfaction. Unwavering commitment to Jesus Christ results in soul satisfaction. What were you hunting for before you found Jesus? That place in your heart to be filled that was missing, that God-shaped hole in your heart. And yet, as, as, as wonderful as that was, so many times we start trying to pull God out of our heart and go back to doing the things we used to do. Jesus is saying here, keep your eyes on the prize. Stay focused and don't look back. And when you do that, that same satisfaction, that feeling, that peace you got when you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior will only grow. You see, that's in part the reward. The blessing, if you will, for following Christ. You see, following Christ wholeheartedly means that we will impact people for God in more powerful ways than we could ever have imagined. That's the reward. That's the blessing. Seeing the Holy Spirit move in the heart and life of someone and see them accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior blows your mind better than any drug, any alcohol, any roller coaster ride ever could even begin to do. You see, if Christ is our utmost priority, we are in for the adventure of a lifetime. And there's no roller coaster on this planet that can give us a thrill like being a 100% committed Christian in love with Christ and on fire for Him. And when our ride on earth with Christ runs out, when they turn that roller coaster off, the fringe benefits are even better. They're indeed out of this world. Heaven is the reward, and that's why Paul could proclaim in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is to gain. Is it easy? No way. Will I need to sacrifice things in my life? You bet. Will I suffer? Maybe. But here's a word from 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17 to encourage you. Where Paul said, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 
Now, will we at times falter in our service to Christ? Yes. Will our decision to make Jesus number one in our lives fall short at times? Yes. I can remember how my own commitment to serve Christ wholeheartedly has suffered failure at times. And the tragedy is not that we occasionally fail in making Jesus our number one priority. The tragedy is not getting back up on our feet after that failure with an even deeper commitment for allegiance and service to our Lord and Savior. I failed you, God, and I'm so sorry. And with your might and your spirit, I will never do that again. And I'm going to do this so that I can make sure that the next time I don't fail you. Rather than wallowing in the self-pity that Satan wants to keep you in of the fact that you stumbled yet again. Folks, do you think God knows you're human? That's a silly question, isn't it? And yet there's many times that we ourselves forget that we're human. Or we think that somehow God has forgotten that we're human. He knew that. After all, He's the one that created us. Of course He knows we're human. He knows you're going to fall before you fall. But what He's looking for is for you to recognize when you've fallen and look up and reach up and grab a hold of His hand and get up and go forward. I encourage you today, live for Christ without reservation, without hesitation, without indecision or fluctuation. Live for Jesus with determination. Live for Jesus with resolution. Live for Jesus with perseverance and fortitude. With the help of the Holy Spirit who resides in you. With the Word of God to guide you. And with a determined fixing of your eyes on Jesus Christ, this is possible. Even for me. Now as a pastor... My prayer, my hope, my vision is that we would witness in churches across America and the world, even here in our very own midst at Shepherd's Fold, a resurrection of commitment and 100% surrender to Jesus Christ. On the campus of David Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee, there was a tall wooden cross erected following the terrorist attack on America in 9-11. And written in bold red letters on this cross were the words, I surrender all. You see, that's the message of Jesus' parable here in Luke 9. Things, tradition, cultural expectations, even family, all should be surrendered for the sake of Jesus Christ. No second thoughts, no looking back. So I leave you with this question today. Are you fit for duty in the service of God? It means being different than the world. For following Jesus is not about harboring second thoughts. It's about having a heart and a spirit that boldly declares, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Martin Luther is reported to have said, a religion that gives nothing, that costs nothing, that suffers nothing, is worth nothing. I encourage you today, review your own life as a disciple of Christ and determine your fitness for duty. And if you find areas that are lacking, get on your knees and seek the Lord. Ask forgiveness for the sins that you've committed and repent and turn from your wicked ways and go back to being sold out 100% for the person who gave his all for you. Review your own life as a disciple of Christ. Determine your fitness for duty. Measure it by the evidence in your life of your commitment to follow Christ regardless of the cost. Measure it by the evidence in your life 
of making Christ your first priority and the ultimate authority who has your unflinching loyalty. This is our call, fellow soldiers, and I call you to answer that call today. Amen.